When I was driving around just looking for the next spot to shoot a video, I decided to stop right here because you guys just crack me up sometimes in the comments with the things you say about the neighborhoods, which is just funny to me because there are so many cars parked up and down uh, people's yards and stuff over in this area. And to be fair, there are some multifamily uh, units over here. I think maybe that building over there and one behind me over here is. so. That's probably the reason for maybe some extra cars, but most of the ones we're gonna see down this way, it's all houses. We just got people parking in yards and crazy stuff like that. So <laughs> you guys know that I listened to you because I thought of you when I decided to shoot here. And guys, I just wanna say once again, thanks for everybody who watches the channel real quick. There have been a ton of comments lately and it's to the point where I no longer can physically answer them all. Just you know, timing wise and between making the videos and planning the next one and editing and shooting and all this. So I always figure it's better to make the next video than it is to just be in the comments all day. But I do try to answer as many of them as I can. And I always appreciate hearing your thoughts and opinions. So thank you for that. Now, some of my favorite topics to cover recently are obviously the housing market. I also like talking about remote work whenever I can. But another thing that I've been enjoying talking about lately is retirement. And the last time I talked about retirement, some people were like, oh, you're too young to talk about retirement. But that's already really stupid, guys, because obviously the younger you are that you start thinking about retirement, then the better chance you'll even have to be entering retirement at all. Because if you're not thinking about retirement, then chances are you'll probably never retire. See, even though I'm in my 30s, I'm thinking about retirement, I'm talking about retirement because it's an important thing to address and it's interesting to watch what's happening right now with retirement because when you look at the generation that's supposed to be going into retirement today, some interesting things are starting to happen. About half of all baby boomers and one third of Generation X, they expect to work past age 70 or possibly never even retire at all. That's basically the plan. I'm working at least until 70 or beyond, or maybe I'll just never retire, probably because can't afford to. Not a big surprise with how things are going out there. Look at this one. We even got tiny little palm trees to mark <laughs> the parking spots here. Unbelievable. It's estimated right now that baby boomers have saved a median number of about $162,000 in their retirement account, and they have roughly about 15 grand saved in savings for an emergency fund, basically. So, and then the rest of the plan for people in this age group, baby boomers that are looking to retire, they're hoping that between that amount of savings and social security is gonna be enough to carry them into retirement. And just as a young guy, I know I live in an expensive area like Miami Beach. It's not cheap to live here for sure. If I move back to the Midwest, I could easily cut my household expenses in half, maybe even more. But even if you live in the Midwest, guys, where I grew up and I'm from, you know, retiring on just Social Security alone and then having 160 grand in your retirement portfolio with 15 grand in savings, I would be scared. I would probably be one of those people who would be planning to work past 70 or maybe never retire at all, even if I had that, because that definitely doesn't sound like enough. I mean, you run into some medical problems or some major issues with your house or whatever, family problems, something happens, that money can be wiped out in a matter of a few years. The last time we talked about retirement, if you end up needing to go into some kind of assisted living facility later on because you can't take care of yourself and you don't have any family that can or is willing to take care of you, those places can cost like eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month if you're in a private facility and you're not in a Medicaid facility. So just imagine, just in one year, your whole $165,000 is almost totally gone. And as we discussed in that video, the number one reason people go bankrupt in retirement is because of medical problems. You know, they, they can't pay their medical bills. They get in over their heads with these assisted living facilities and surgeries and unexpected things that happen. And unfortunately, it's enough to make people go bust. And so that's why as a young guy, I think it's important for me to pay attention to this. And I don't have any shame in discussing it either because I want other people in my age group or who are even younger that listen to me to start thinking about it as well. Because I, in my opinion, the only way you're ever gonna retire in today's world 
is on your own, guys. You need to have investments. You need to have ongoing income into retirement that is paying you even if you're not working. To me, that is gonna be the only way that people will be able to retire in 20 years from now. There's not gonna be uh, pension funds that are gonna be paying anybody by then. They'll probably all be either gone or bankrupt as well. The 401k, I mean, if you look at the baby boomers, the baby boomers had like the most advantageous situation in pretty much all of American history when it came to uh, the growth in asset prices and wealth and wages. I mean, you guys got to experience the biggest boom cycle basically ever. I mean, baby boomers lived in what I would say is was the golden age of American growth. And now we're in this big phase of uh, negative growth that we're probably going to be looking at over the next few years. And when you look at a generation that had all these advantages, financially speaking, and the average 401k balance, or I'm sorry, median balance right now going into retirement is 162 grand. It's a joke. Now, you could point to a lot of things. You could say, well, things were going so well and uh, you know, we just spent money on other things. We didn't save as much as we could have or should have or whatever. And that's the reason why these account balances are low. Or maybe it's just because life is expensive and that's all they could save. Or the type of jobs that people had and, and had these 401ks, that was all that they could afford to contribute. So, I don't know. To me, 162 grand in, an, in a retirement account and 15 grand in savings is not even close to enough to retire, guys. Let me know what you think about that. Um, if you are planning on retiring soon, you know, share as much info as you want down below. Um, don't share anything you're not comfortable with, but let people know what your retirement plan is if you are entering retirement right now. So it gives people like me and others who you know, might be thinking about this a glimpse into how other people are doing it and plan to sustain themselves until the end. And Gen Xers who were born between 1965 and 1980, they are in a situation where 38% of them expect to retire at age 70 or older or they don't plan to retire at all and 55% plan to work in retirement. So you pretty much have half of these people saying that we're going to need to continue to do some kind of work even after we retire in order to make ends meet. That's pretty much where the situation lies. And I think that's pretty much going to be the common denominator going forward because these guys have even less money saved right now. They got about $87,000 median balance in their 401k accounts and only have about $5,000 in emergency savings. That's it, guys. I don't actually see how it's financially possible for people to retire if you're in this situation and you're getting kind of close to retirement age that it might be too late to kind of catch up and you get the amount of income you need to really make it happen. And then you got people my age, millennials, who have about a median balance of $50,000 in their household retirement accounts right now and only about $3,000 in the form of an emergency savings account. So obviously people in my generation are nowhere near retirement, you know, age-wise or financially speaking. But back to my original thing of why I wanted to bring this up, because if you are my age or younger, it's not too late. You can still put yourself in a position where retirement is on the table in the future. But just not thinking about it and ignoring it and saying, oh, you're too young to start thinking about it is stupid, guys. And that's how people end up with, you know, not enough money to retire, essentially. Even 73% of the millennials who were surveyed for this say that they're pretty much worried that Social Security won't be there by the time we get to retirement age. And I used to hear this way back during the last Great Recession and the last financial crisis that that could end up being the case. And I think it could be. Supposedly, Social Security is basically a Ponzi scheme. You know, you have people my age that are paying for people who are older, but since the population is shrinking and the baby boomer is a huge generation, they're probably going to suck most of the money out of that system over the next 20 years. And by the time people my age get there or Gen Xers, there's not going to be much left. It's probably going to be like the pension funds where you'll be lucky to get half or a fraction of what you were supposed to get or maybe nothing at all. That's my guess of where the future of Social Security lies. Obviously, the politicians don't do anything to fix it. They all just kick the can down the road. So once again, what's the message here, guys? 
you can't rely on Social Security, you can't rely on the 401k, you got to have a lot of things going on if you want to have any shot at retirement in the future. And there was another survey done separate from this one on only wealthy millennials and wealthy meaning they have like a three million dollar net worth or higher. So you're doing pretty good if you're in that age category and you have a three million dollar net worth. So people 21 to 42 years old, they say that it's not possible to achieve above average financial returns with just the stock market alone. And that ties in directly with what I just said. You can't rely on just the 401k or social security in retirement. And people that have made $3 million by their mid thirties kind of know us a thing or two about money, wouldn't you say? And this is what they say they do. They say they allocate only 25% of their portfolios to stocks compared to 55% who are older investors, maybe baby boomers, right? And they also allocate a higher percentage of their portfolio to alternative investments like private equity, commodities, and real estate, and even fine art these rich millennials are investing in. Another thing that they say they're investing in is 15% of their portfolios are also cryptocurrency. Look at that. Now I own cryptocurrency, I own some Bitcoin and some Ethereum, and um, obviously it's, it's way down right now. And I, I believe that it has the potential to go up in the future. But when I first invested in it, my thought was I'm gonna invest what I basically can afford to lose. And if it returns me nothing and I get none of that money back ever, then I just need to be okay with losing it. So that's what I did and I'm pretty much back to where we paid for it right now you know we're pretty much breaking even at this point we haven't made any money or lost any money when it comes to our initial investment and of course i could have sold it when it was over sixty thousand dollars and you know tripled my money but i didn't do that because i personally am a long-term investor and thinker and i'm thinking about the future and i'm not thinking about well bitcoin sixty thousand today i'm thinking that you know in the future maybe it's over two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand Maybe then I'll think about getting rid of it. I also think that there's a potential to transact in large ticket items like real estate in the future with Bitcoin and other types of crypto. Speaking of real estate, we got one for sale. This listing is about two months old. They had a $150,000 price cut and now the property is under contract and they originally bought it for $900,000. I've even seen some houses for sale here in Miami over the past few years that said they will accept Bitcoin as a form of payment. The problem is I talked to the title company that I work with and it's pretty much impossible to transfer a clear title over to somebody who does a transaction in Bitcoin right now because it's not like an accepted form of currency and they can't put that in escrow and essentially transfer it to the seller once it's all done. So it pretty much has to be a private transaction, similarly to like if you're selling your used car to somebody else and then just, you know, hand over the deed and they can go and record it in their name. So there is a pretty big element of risk to doing that right now. And I hope that in the future that Bitcoin and other type of cryptocurrencies that they might consider for real estate transactions start getting used this way because I think that's the perfect application for it. Especially if the value of Bitcoin is somewhere over $100,000 eventually. I mean, it doesn't make sense to buy your milk and groceries with that. Obviously, it can be uh, divided down into very small fractions of a token. To me, the more practical way to use a currency like that would be for big ticket items, buying a new car, buying a house, things like that that cost a lot of money or require a large down payment. And one of the other reasons that these wealthy millennials don't really trust the stock market to give them the returns that were promised in the past is because just look at this simple piece of history right here. If you would have invested $100 in the S&P 500 in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even the 80s, Uh, you would have seen roughly a 10 to 11% annual return on your investment as of today. But if you go into the year 2000 and beyond and you were to do that same investment, now you're looking at only about a 6% return between over the last 22 years. So that's significantly lower guys. That's about half of the return that people were getting the previous decades. And so I think these wealthy millennials are onto something. They realize that 
there are other ways to create wealth now. There's, there's more ways than just the stock market. And everything is so much more manipulated today than it ever was before. And I just love the way that these guys have really taken matters into their own hands and have found ways to create their own wealth similarly to what I do. I do the same thing and I'm definitely not a multimillionaire like that, but my plan is the same to look outside of just the traditional forms of, you know, investing in a 401k for a lifetime and just hope that it's enough by the end. To me, that's not enough if you want to see retirement. And honestly, for me, I like this, guys. You know, making these YouTube videos is fun for me, and I don't see why I would ever have to quit. Even if I'm 70 years old, I could still do this theoretically. For me, personally, it's not just about retirement. It's just about having uh, financial security now and well into the future, because I definitely don't want to be struggling in the later years of life. You just want to, to take it easy and be able to afford your lifestyle without a whole lot of stress. I mean, that's ideally, everyone's goal all the time, but you definitely don't want that level of stress, especially financial stress, when you get into old age. I wanna address a couple of questions that came in about the hurricane-related damage and, and different situations that are related to this. So one of the questions is, uh, what happens to your rental if it got wiped out by the hurricane? Do you still have to pay rent? Because obviously homeowners still have to pay their mortgage even if it got wiped out, unless they make a deal with their lender. There is a statute in the Florida Landlord Tenant Act. If a place is deemed uninhabitable or unlivable, then the tenant can basically immediately vacate the premises and basically the landlord still needs to give back your deposit and any advance rent that you paid as well because it's not your fault that the place is unlivable. So if you have a lease here in Florida and you were affected by this, then you are allowed to terminate the lease with no penalty to you because the place is unlivable. And a very similar situation, like say you have a four bedroom house and there was some damage and just one bedroom is uninhabitable. Like it had some damage with some broken windows or you know part of the roof is leaking in that area but the rest of the house is fine. If that's the situation, then what you're entitled to then is to get a, a fair deduction based on the portion of the home that's not usable. So I would say if it's a four bedroom home, probably 25% off the rent would be fair. So if you're in a partially damaged home, that's the situation you're looking at. And one thing that's popping up after this hurricane is of course more scams. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but this can also apply to basically anywhere, guys, because one of the most common scams that's happening right now after the hurricane is charity scams. So you have fake charities, people creating fake charities, especially they'll create ones that kind of look like the real ones. So you have um, the American Red Cross, which is a real charity, for example, and they'll create something like the US Red Cross. So it'll be very similar and the logos and everything will kind of look the same, their branding and all of this. Maybe they'll even have a similar phone number, who knows? And they'll try to trick people into uh, basically thinking that this is a legitimate charity and they try to get your money. And the other common way that people will go after you is you can get these phishing text messages and emails and uh, even you can get friend requests and instant messages on platforms like Facebook, stuff like that where you can get an instant message from another user. They're targeting people everywhere now. So literally anywhere you're online, even your mailbox, guys, you need to watch out for scams. You can literally get fake mail delivered from these fake charities asking you to donate. Basically, if you are gonna donate anything for this hurricane or another cause or whatever, it needs to be really well researched before you give a single dime. Otherwise, you could just be giving your money over to scammers. So just be careful for that. But when there's a tragedy like this and people are desperate, you know, this is when the scams start really ramping up. And just a quick tip on this that I read, that if you are gonna donate to a charity, then they say to always use a credit card to donate. Don't give them cash, don't write a check, because those forms of payment are much harder to 
get back or trace in the event that you do get scammed and you're probably gonna end up losing the money. And something similar to this happened to me a few years ago. I bought my wife a Christmas present. You know, I'm looking around the internet to try to find this gift and I found this website where the item was significantly lower priced than some other websites that I heard of before like Bed Bath & Beyond or Macy's, Target, whatever. So I was like, okay, let me take a chance and buy it from this place. Everything looked legit. It looked like a real website and everything. Long story short, it was a scam. And I'm sure you're gonna see a lot of that right now, especially during the holidays. So as you're doing your holiday shopping, be careful with that. The good thing was, obviously I had to use a credit card to make the purchase. And since you know most credit cards these days have a buyer protection aspect to it, where if you do have fraudulent charges or something like this were to happen, they'll refund you all of your money. And that's exactly what happened. I got my money back. It sucks you have to be on the phone a little bit and go through the dispute process. But pretty much anytime these days I'm unsure of any purchase, I will use my American Express card because I have been through several credit card disputes in my lifetime. And American Express, guys, this is not sponsored or anything, but they are literally the best when it comes to customer service and dealing with disputes and stuff like that. I've never lost a dispute with them. On the flip side, Bank of America, they're the worst. You're gonna be on the phone for hours. They make you fax, yeah, fax in paperwork to prove that you're right and all this BS. So be careful when you're shopping online. Don't use a Bank of America credit card. <laughs> Use your American Express if you can, or at least a better card than Bank of America. The City card is also a really good one too. Now, if you guys wanna get alerted every time I put out an upload, just make sure to hit the bell notification down below. And if you don't wanna wait for the next upload, I have another one sitting right over here for you. And I'll see you guys over in the next video.